Well, good afternoon, and thanks for staying awake. I want to thank Peter Ho and, and his team for inviting me. This is a great honor for me to be here in Singapore. Um, my dad, who recently passed away, I used to uh, work for IBM. He worked for them uh, 30 years, and he always talked very highly of Singapore and the people here, and he really loved coming. Um, so it's really cool to be able to come back, you know, uh, and, and you know, experience what he experienced. And I totally agree with him. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, I had a traditional kind of presentation, even though the topic seemed a little uh, advanced, uh, you know, the automation of terrorism. Uh, but I uh, changed it slightly given the presentations I saw over the last couple days to make it even more interesting. What I'd like to do is uh, just come up with a very, very tight definition of black swans and black elephants and then use that to uh, look at uh, the terrorism landscape, the political, uh, political uh, uh, disruption that's been going on recently, and uh, come up with a bunch of black swans that fall out of that framework. Um, I find that you know, keeping it tight, keeping it very simple, keep, uh, that kind of framework can, can uh, be very illuminating and uh, you know, provide lots of insight. Uh, my uh, view of, of what a black swan is, is that it's a byproduct of humanity's learning process. You know, we go out, we, we uh, you know, confront the messy reality, we, we evolve, we uh, you know, come up with new systems and new methods of doing things, and you know, assumptions change. And when those assumptions change, there's discontinuity, there's breakage. And uh, what you're looking for is you know, rapid adaptation to those, that breakdown in assumptions. And a black elephant is a big technological trend or a big change in, in the way the world uh, is set up. Uh, and as it rolls through, it breaks assumptions and creates black swans in its wake. It's a pretty simple kind of approach to things. Uh, black swans and, and black elephants are all man-made. They're not natural phenomena. They're not made from the natural world. They're not produced by you know, uh, earthquakes or, or tornadoes. Um, so when I take that kind of very, very austere definition of what they are, uh, I can then apply it to uh, the terrorism landscape in, a, in an interesting way. Uh, the two black elephants I want to use is social networking and artificial intelligence. Uh, social networking, you know, it, uh, when, when we started working on it, and I was involved in the early days in 2001 to three, uh, you know, building it, it was very high-minded. Uh, we thought we were building knowledge networks, and when we built podcast technology, we thought we were you know, improving the world and you know, making it very easy to accumulate information and knowledge uh, and, and do great things. Um, it's done a lot of that. Uh, but it's evolved way beyond that. It's become a nervous system. It's, it's become a, a way of interacting uh, on a global level. Uh, it's changing our politics. It's changing how we uh, convey information. It's changing how we consume news uh, in many, many ways. Uh, and that has an impact at the individual level, at the uh, national level, and at the global level. The other thing is uh, artificial intelligence. And we heard a lot about artificial intelligence, but uh, from the people I know who are involved in the field, um, it's a little bit more traumatic and will have many more assumptions changed than, than uh, was first indicated. Uh, it's a big departure from the way we've solved problems in the past. Uh, we solve problems in the, in the engineering, using engineering approaches, using physics, in a, in a reductionist kind of approach uh, where we build models and we build solutions based on those models. Uh, the stuff that works in AI doesn't do that. It's a holistic approach. And what it does, it learns through experience. And that's where we've gotten all the gains over the last five years. The deep learning, uh, the uh, reinforcement networks. Uh, these systems learn very much more like, uh, you know, your kid would learn how to catch a ball when you're playing catch. You know, your kid doesn't use physics, and you don't use math to explain what, how the learning process evolves. They just learn by doing, experiencing. Uh, it's very possible, given what we can do with deep learning, is to uh, basically take everything that humanity is currently doing and then capture it in a neural network uh, to make it easy to transfer and, and share across the world. Uh, that's going to have traumatic 
consequences, but it will also do open up incredible opportunities in terms of you know, how employment evolves. Um, some really cool stuff coming our way that way. Uh, but that will have an implication on the local, national, and global level as well. So let me, so now we have basically a, a two by three matrix, those two black elephants and the local, national, and global level. Let's start at the social networking at the global level. And we saw as a black swan uh, over the last five years, uh, the uh, ability of people using social networks to mobilize on a vast scale. We saw it first uh, uh, with the no Nomas Farc movement, uh, the big protests out of Colombia against, against Farc. Uh, that went on on a global scale. It, went, it was de developed very, very quickly. Came out of nowhere. The government wasn't ready for it, but it went a long way to helping Colombia solve their problem. Uh, we saw it then in the, the Arab Spring. Uh, we saw uh, big movements move like contagion from Tunisia to Libya to Egypt to Syria, uh, the governments that uh, capitulated to those movements are still relatively solid now. Uh, they didn't go through a traumatic consequence. And the ones that fought it are now disaster zones. And these movements followed a pattern of, of organization uh, that we hadn't seen before. And it's made possible uh, by social networking. Uh, it was something I picked up in the Iraq war when I wrote my first book, uh, Brave New War. It's called an open source movement. An open source movement allows groups of many different motivations and reasons for fighting and, and, and uh, taking part in a war or a protest to join together and accomplish a big goal. Uh, typically, they come together uh, to do one simple thing. It's called a plausible promise in open source software. It's this like uniting uh, goal that, that's you know, very simple in, in concept. In, Egypt, it was, an, you know, remove Mubarak, remove that corruption. And that brought together many, many different groups uh, from all different motivations to move that, you know, to achieve that goal. And every time somebody tried to make that goal more complicated, like, well, let's negotiate a constitution, let's do this or that, they were just pushed to the side. The people that moved forward in achieving that goal were the ones that were followed until it was accomplished. And most recently, we saw a different kind of motiv uh, mobilization with ISIS, is where when it put out the call, 30,000 people from all over the world flooded in to Syria to, to turn a, a, a kind of a ragtag guerrilla group into a global force that could just expand and, and rapidly expand its territory. And there were people being motivated and pulled out of just about any uh, circumstance you could possibly imagine. I mean, I have a friend who was a reporter in southern France, and she's sitting there in a room, kind of like uh, a conference room full of you know, Christian families who saw their kids motivated by the concept of being you know, included in, 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 a, in, a, in a heroic struggle, and they left to go join, and fight, uh, join ISIS and fight in Syria. So the ability of social networking to facilitate Mass mobilization on a, on a global scale has been demonstrated and is still evolving in terms of what it can do. So that's a, something we're going to watch. We still don't really even have a grasp, a full grasp of you know, how it actually works and, and how it's going to evolve over time. Now we move it down to the national level. Uh, there hasn't been really much discussion about uh, how social networking impacted the US election, at least in this forum. Uh, a lot of people talk about fake news. That's not new in US politics. There's lots of fake news in every election cycle, a tremendous amount, actually. Even fake phone calls that say the election, the, the election has been canceled. <laughs> People get those on, 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 on normal election cycles. It happens all the time. Uh, what was interesting about this election cycle uh, were two different things. It was one is that they were a weaponization of, being, of, of social networking in terms of trolls. Uh, and it was more than just what the Russians were doing. We had 4chan and other groups doing it here in the States. Uh, I got an interview on the, the Donald, which is the, you know, the big Reddit group that uh, created a, a lot of these trolls. Uh, they made the lives of, of, of anyone in the media absolutely hell. They just piled on. And between the individuals who were crowdsourcing to do that, and the, the bots, it was just overwhelming in terms of shutting down the media. 
Uh, the other thing that was uh, going on is, is, is that we changed the way we consumed the news. You know, it used to be, and this is kind of an esoteric point, but it, it's really kind of cool, is that uh, we listened to the big news outlets and, and, and f basically absorbed what they told us or how they uh, told us the uh, news should be consumed. So it's called a way to understand this is called a motive conjugation or the Russell conjugation. It's, you know, you read the New York Times, you don't read it to get the facts, you read it to get the context for consuming the facts. Uh, the emotional words that surround it, whether it's a, a beleaguered politician or a plan, a dead plan or whatever else, all these emotional words are what the sophisticated establishment player at the New York Times that's how they see the news, and you should absorb that in that way. Uh, just a quick example of a, of, a, of a motive conjugation is, you know, as Bertrand Russell would say, is so it's an example of, you take the, the simple fact uh, that somebody doesn't want to change your mind, and I would be, you know, firm in my resolve, the other person would be intransigent, and the third person would be pigheaded, and that same fact would shift depending on how the language that you use to describe it. So what happened in that instance is that uh, the control of the emotional words surrounding news, uh, you know, at the, at the news media level, that was lost. And uh, what happened is that when you consume news in the US media now online, is that you are in a cycle where you repeat the emotional words and the words evolve within that group. So uh, in the US, during the election cycle, we had two groups, the right and the left, and they both used uh, moral words and emotional words to describe the news uh, in ways that were totally opposite. And they had, according to recent studies, no crossover effect. So I had a network of, say, 50 Hillary supporters, 50 Trump supporters. And I could watch them online where they never would cross. They would see the same news in totally different contexts. And the, the emotional words stuck within that group. It was repeated like, almost like a chant. To, show, to signal that you were part of that group. So that kind of, the assumption that we thought is that we would work more together, there would be more flow of news, but what actually happened, the assumption that changed is that social networking, when it's fully advanced, can f fragment a political system very quickly, and there's really no exit from it in the US right now, there's no way to navigate out. So uh, how did social networking change things on the, on the personal level. Uh, we saw something really recently that was a, a significant innovation, is how ISIS moved from, from planned attacks to self-actualizing attacks, or, or, or self-activating uh, uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, that hadn't been done before. It was really deemed almost impossible to get people to self-activate. You know, most of the attacks up to about two years ago were planned events, and they're ways of actually intercepting the communication, ways of, of figuring out how that, uh, those, those lines of communication and support actually work so you can intercept the attack before it actually occurs. And what we saw is a, is a pretty dramatic shift for a, for a whole year uh, that these attacks were occurring uh, based on people not even getting any support. They were self-activating act, you know, based on uh, a, a very interesting formula. Uh, that they were told that if they went online, or they did their own planning, and they went online and, and, and pledged fealty in a very kind of medieval way, that they would be uh, accepted in as, as holy warriors. Uh, and uh, that formula ended up being very popular. You know, you saw it in place in, in Orlando, you saw it in Nice, you saw it in uh, Paris. Uh, they even used Facebook Live, where they could actually say they pledged the oath of, of allegiance online in real time during the attack. Uh, and the attack size, it was actually the equivalent in, in, in terms of frequency as well as uh, the size of the attack, casualties of the attack, as it was uh, in the planned attacks that, were, that had occurred earlier. So uh, that kind of innovation, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, people can actually you know, self-activate using social networking, it was a pretty dramatic change in assumptions. Um, you know, how does AI change that? And this, these tend to be a little bit more speculative because these are a little bit farther out. Is that uh, 
Now, what we're seeing in the U.S. Is, is, is considerably different than the rest of the world in terms of Islamic terrorism. We see people just going nuts, uh, you know, a very nihilistic kind of approach where they go into a workplace, they go into places and just shoot. Uh, those people represent a massive pool of people that could actually be turned on to uh, terrorist acts. Uh, it's kind of a scary prospect, and they're not based on any kind of strong affiliation to any ideology. Uh, what you can do with AI is automate that. Uh, one of the ways in is an example, we see this a lot in the States. There's even a TV show on it called Catfish. It's this idea that you can actually get somebody to fall in love with you just through online interaction, and they will do incredible things, even though they never met you. They spend all their money, they'll go do nutty stuff, uh, and it happens to even you know, relatively sophisticated internet users. And this happens all the time, enough to you know, have a whole MTV a TV program, reality TV program dedicated to it. Place where, when it gets really scary, and they used you know, some of these you know, kind of honeypot approaches to recruit people to go to Syria and, and commit tax in the past, but if you um, use AI, or especially conversational AI, uh, you can actually automate many of these uh, conversations that lead to that kind of event. Uh, conversational AI has gotten really good. In, in fact, it's not the kind of, you can talk about anything, it's, it's a, a AI based on a, on a very specific narrative or, or set of constraints. They already passed a Turing test at that level, about 12 to 15 years old. Um, these AIs are, going, are being developed almost everywhere right now. And with a little bit of sophistication, particularly if it was done at the nation state level, uh, because given this power, uh, you can actually create malware and software that uh, doesn't disrupt technical infrastructure, it actually disrupts social infrastructure, social disruption. And it's very tempting as a, as a, as a nation state to develop software that does it, to develop you know, out of the blue a fifth column using false flag motivations uh, that rips a country apart and people are doing in extreme acts uh, based on motivations you can't actually put your finger on. The, um, the inevitable outcome of that is maybe what we saw with recently with all the, the NSA's, or I mean the CIA's uh, zero day attacks, is that that will be leaked, it will be lost, and you have a social disruption malware in a raw form out for anybody to use. Uh, and if you put it on a bot network, because now you can run actually with the, uh, Google's TensorFlow, you, they have a runtime for cell phones. You can run it on a cell phone, you know, a, a trained AI. Uh, that is the perfect bot network for a terrorism to occur on an ongoing basis without any kind of human control at all. It's completely automated. So that is the danger at the, at the local level. At the uh, national level, what we're seeing is that we've made the assumption that most censorship and control over extremism was done at the, at the country level. Uh, that's not true anymore. What we're seeing is that you know, we've abdicated to Facebook and Google. Uh, they're taking control of censorship and anti-extremism. I mean, Facebook now runs uh, AIs that they're building to uh, clamp down on anyone uploading uh, an extremist video. They can analyze a video in real time and, or analyze a Facebook Live in real time and pick out anything that would look like it would be extreme and shut it down. They also have uh, legions of, of $15 an hour workers in, in, in Ireland and other places that, that if they d think that you are extreme, they'll be looking into your message flows on Facebook. So in many uh, real ways, we've abdicated a lot of the nation state responsibility to, to a tech company and run by uh, adolescents to a large extent. Um, and we're, where this goes and where this ends up is, is anybody's guess, particularly as they add AI to start uh, tamping down on, on speech in a variety of instances. And the last one is um, less about terrorism. It kind of flows out of the assumption you know, we had on the first day, this idea that you know, China has risen. 
It's not rising anymore, it's risen. And you know, looked at it, looked at it from uh, this current trade perspective, sure. Um, but from my perspective, combining social networks and AI, uh, you know, I look at the, the global map, I see two footprints. I see China and I see the rest of the world. And the rest of the world's connected by Facebook and Google, all the rest of the world. I mean, Facebook's already over two billion active users, billion, and it's going north. And China has already pretty much peaked with WeChat. And that social network map is a good indicator of where the AI network map was going to be. Because as we move from the current economy of industrialization and, and personal services and you know, bureaucratic processes to the AI economy, uh, that's going to change significantly how work is accomplished and where value is created. And it's very possible in the next 20 to 30 years, the most valuable things we create as a, as in the world will be AIs. And there'll be AIs for almost anything in every field, in every niche, in every corner. And the employment that comes out of that uh, won't be traditional employment. It's going to be the stuff that actually is used to build AIs today. And that's two things. That's data and that's training. And the data that AIs need is, is huge. In fact, the current studies, just the study just a couple days ago by Google, is that the more data you get, the better. And it's not the, just the passive data that we accumulate using current systems. It's data that people actively contribute to and modify. They, they, they tag. They, they uh, actually perform a specific act with, with and that's recorded and that's then used as data to train AIs. Uh, this is not going to be stuff that, that uh, uh, cannot just be offloaded to kind of uh, corporations kind of enticing people to do stuff on the cheap. Uh, to get really good AIs, you need people actively accumulating that data. Uh, we see it passively a little bit on Facebook. Facebook now is kind of the center of the world and pretty, pretty much the, the online policeman of the world. Uh, is building its, the, some of the best facial recognition software in the, using AI. Uh, they can pick you out of a field with a, based on a picture, if you're in the database, uh, of about 900 million people in five seconds. And that software, now that it's trained, can be squeezed down and put on a cell phone. I mean, they basically have potentially the biggest surveillance network in the world, and they can roll it out like that to, to go after uh, uh, anyone they deem a threat. Um, the other part in terms of like uh, training, what we're seeing is uh, training in, in uh, Uber right now, is that you're, uh, when your car, which is autonomously dri driven, makes an error, you correct it. And that correction is then improving the performance of the car, and then it can inform the improvement of performance of all the cars. Uh, that is actually turning into a kind of a formal twist, is that when you, there's uh, new methodologies that will allow a human intervention in, in the training of AI that, that would allow people to actually identify paths of improvement that uh, are better in terms of achieving the goals, the human, human uh, valued goals. Uh, and that kind of training activity is going to be highly valued over the long term. Uh, so if you're looking for where the jobs are going to be created in AI, they'll be created in training and in data. So how does this apply to China is that China is not part of that big data effort and training effort. And the AIs that they create versus the AIs the rest of the world creates are not going to be compatible. And if those are the most valuable things you create, as a society, as an economy, the export market, the export value of the product that's, that you're producing goes to zero. So by di you know, separating yourself out from the bigger system, you devalue yourself, devalue yourself in the future by not being part of that a creative effort. It's kind of a different kind of black swan approach using AI uh, and in the creation of value in the global economy. That's it. Thanks.